we should start now so that we are all on time so hello everybody uh, i am shweta narkar and a very very warm welcome to all of you um to our first session after the coffee break um we would like to start by thanking all of you to sh uh, sh for showing up and ha sharing these common interests with us Today we are going to get to know more about Jupyter notebooks and how we can harness their full potential. I would like to introduce you to my co-conveners, Amanda Leish and Brenda Thompson, and all three of us uh, are multidisciplinary science PhD students at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, uh, working with Dr. Peter Fox. Uh, and now let me introduce you to the amazing speakers that we have lined up for you today. I am very, very excited about having them here, and we are so grateful that they accepted our invitation and decided and agreed to talk at this session today. Uh, first up, we have Dr. Lindsay Hagee, who is an active contributor to the project Jupiter, and she works in data science and interactive computing uh, using Jupiter in geosciences. She will be co-presenting with none other than Dr. Fernando Perez. who is the co-founder of project jupiter and his present research focuses on creating tools for modern computational research and data science across the domain disciplines and then we have dr lynn elkins who is an isotope geochemist and a petrologist um i just realized i'm not sharing my screen i'm so sorry <laughs> and yes then we have dr lynn elkins who is an isotope geochemist and petrologist whose research focuses on using geochemistry to better understand earth's dynamic processes and studying the isotopic makeup of igneous rocks and related materials to better understand their geologic origins her process of adoption of jupiter notebooks as not just a tool for complex system modeling but also as a medium for publications is something we're really, really looking forward to so to quickly give you an overview of the next hour and a half we know we have a very diverse audience here today and for that reason we are going to start off with a med taking us through some jupiter basics and getting everyone onto the same page then we are going to have our first talk by dr hegi and professor paris followed by our second talk by dr elkins and then we are going to open up the floor for a discussion uh we are also going to share this slide deck with you but the notes are also open for you um to comment on what we did was that we have created slides for you to drop in questions uh so you will find individual slides one for professor um Perez and Dr. Lindsay, and one for Professor Elkins. And along with that, um, in, you will also uh, find that before we can kick off this session, you had a document where you joined us from the Kiko chat. So there's the notes document where we would like you to sign in um, for our particular. present awesome so we would also like you guys to sign in on to our session which is available from uh, the page that you joined our room from um isip would also like us to remind you to go through the community guidelines if you haven't gotten a chance to do that yet and now i will hand it over to amit to walk us through the jupiter basics so amit over to you Thank you, Shweta. Yeah. Hello, everyone. I'm going to share my screen with you all. Right. All right. Thank you all for joining us. And um, as Shweta mentioned, we really wanted our session to be accessible to everyone, including those who may not have any experience with Jupiter at all. And so, um, if we were in a room, I might ask for a show of hands, but Here we are, and instead, I will go through an actual Jupyter notebook to really uh, just showcase the software itself, um, how it is used, and give an example uh, flow of how we could use it. For example, we would use it, our group to do exploratory data analysis 
even some uh, predictive modeling. Um, just to start with, this is a Jupyter Notebook, what you're looking at right now. This is the interface. It's a web-based interface. Um, this is a Jupyter server running on my machine. And so this is my own Jupyter Notebook server. Um, so Jupyter Notebook is the software. Jupyter, uh, the acronym or the uh, abbreviation comes from um, Julia, Python, and R, which really were the initial languages uh, to be used in Jupyter. However, this web-based interactive computational environment supports over a hundred languages. Um, the last time I did a presentation on Jupyter to, you know, just to, in a workshop style uh, session, it was 40 languages. That was uh, three years ago or four years ago almost, um, including Python, R, Ruby, Scala, Haskell, um, C, uh, you name it. Um, there's a clear logical organization to the software. What you're looking at this notebook, it is essentially a list of ordered pairs of input and output cells. So this first cell, for example, contains just text. Um, this text is in Markdown. You could also contain, uh, the cells can contain code, uh, plots, and rich media, uh, video and audio. Um, and so if I enter this cell, you can see this is just the, the, the Markdown code that I've written. And when you run it, you get this output. And so it's a notebook style interface where you can do some analysis. You can read in some data, do analysis, write some documentation and so on. It's, a, it's all um, in one object. Um, it's, it has an interoperable foundation by default. These notebooks are JSON documents and they follow a version schema. And so you can just take this document and send it to another person who can load it into their Jupyter server, uh, view your work, review, uh, build on it and so on. Um, Jupyter Notebook communicates with Jupyter kernels, which is what allows this multi-language support using open to source technologies. Um, these kernels are what allow you to run other languages in Jupyter. Um, of course, you have several, uh, you have, you can export your notebook into um, outputs of, in several standards, such as HTML, PDF, uh, LaTeX, Markdown, and Python uh, to share with others, with others or to communicate maybe results of some analysis. Um, Jupyter kernels that I talked about, these are, um, again, another component of the software. There's the IPython kernel, which is a command shell for interactive computing, in multiple languages. Originally, it was developed for Python. What is the kind of reference, um, you know, um, it is the original kind of uh, kernel that gets installed with Jupyter. Um, IPy widgets and IPy parallel are just, let's say, optional or secondary type uh, uh, components that, that you can use to create actually interactive widgets. So your notebook can have um, controls and inputs and outputs interactivity that you can uh, use to run the code underlying the notebook um, and also uh, options for parallel computing support. Uh, but more importantly, or, um, you know, more uh, uh, more so uh, for other for users, users of other languages other than Python, there is a list of uh, community maintained language specific kernels. Um, we, I believe this link is provided in our slideshow so you can find it. Uh, there's over, I think there are 140 something kernels for all sorts of different languages. And so it is highly extensible. Um, Jupyter Hub, finally, I'll just mention it, won't talk about it much. It is the uh, distributed uh, kind of, or uh, actually it's a, a server implementation of Jupyter where you can um, look at your notebooks and your data side by side in, in one um, location. And then it allows for authentication management of several users, uh, secure access to notebooks and a centralized environment where everything is contained. And so this is good for uh, if you have an organization that uh, all uses the same types of code uh, in education, for example, in a school or in a research group, and then you can all use the same, uh, share the same location and, and work on the same notebook, notebooks, if not concurrently. Um, so I'll just show you uh, really a, a brief scenario of, of data analysis. Um, I do apologize if this is uh, very foundational or basic for some. And if anyone has any taken any course on data analytics or machine learning or predictive analysis, they probably will know the IRIS data set. It's uh, about the IRIS flower, one of the older, older data sets uh, that are still in common use. Um, this is what it looks like, what the data looks like. You have one, two, three, four, five columns. And for each column, um, if let's say it's one flower that was measured, the sepal and petal lengths and widths, along with the class or the type of the flower or the specific type of the iris um, uh, species, or uh, Setosa, Virginica, and 
versicolor, as we'll see. And so by running these simple commands, just reading uh, the data as a CSV file, um, I have this stored in an object. Looking at a summary, this is what the summary is. It will give you the name of every column and really the kind of the distribution of the data, uh, minimum, maximum, quadrants, and median, mean, and so on. This command had shows you the header of the, the head of the data, really the first few, the first six, I think, or seven um, rows. So you can just have a look at the data you just read in, make sure that you've read in the correct file and so on. Um, and again, indexing to look at different parts of the data. Now let's explore the data set. You can do box plots to look at the distribution of the different uh, values or columns in the data set. For example, your set lengths and widths uh, and petal lengths and widths. And these boxes represent where uh, the data is, the mean and uh, really the, the first and the third quadrants and the maximum and min. It gives you a sense of what your data looks like in terms of values and distribution. You can also do more complex visualizations where, for example, you are grouping um, by class or by type. So you we know we have three different classes of the iris flower within this data set. And so you can look at the distribution of the values um, of, for example, petal length, just the one column across these different uh, three different classes. And again, this gives you a, a, a sense of if you have structure within the data set, um, what different um, you know, sections of your data looks like and whether you can use that, for example, to kind of predict what type of flower it is based on its measurements. This is a histogram of, again, one of the columns. Uh -huh. And these are all uh, simple, straightforward commands for you know, uh, basic type or, or initial, uh, initial um, questions you may have about the data set and uh, straight type figures without much customization. But all these can be customized uh, to show more complex uh, queries or perhaps to you know, annotate the diagram with colors and, and so on to show different aspects of the data you're looking at. So this is a histogram. Um, and this is just a 2D plot of the um, petal length along with the petal width, for, exa for example, and colored again by the class of the flower or the species. And so this, again, gives you a sense of how separated the classes are in terms of these true features. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then again, you can do multiples of these and you can, um, you can yeah plot multiple graphs within the same cell output um, and you, so you can look at them side by side. Um, this, for example, is just petal length, petal length again, okay. uh, petal length, petal length, and these uh, with four different yeah. um, okay. other features. So that's what the is. Now, huh? one very basic type of analysis that is that uses a machine learning approach <laughs> is to do clustering on your data set to get a sense of whether uh, or not the, the structure that you could see in these plots is actually quantifiable or that you, whether or not it actually holds. And so this uses a simple, um, let's say a, a simple machine learning model approach called PAM or partitioning around medioids. And what it does really is that you provide it with your data, in this case indexed because we're, we're leaving out the name of the flower or just taking the actual measurements and the number of clusters that you expect to find in this data set. We know we have three classes and throw one. So when we provide three as the value, um, we can look at the output of running the algorithm. This basically gives you the three uh, medioids or the three means around which the three clusters uh, group. And then a clustering vector, which tells you um, to which cluster each one of your rows belongs. So row number one belongs to cluster number one and so on. Um, some more metrics about your uh, the, the actual uh, algorithm and this particular run of the algorithm. And this is a simple, let's say, uh, confusion matrix looking at you know, um, the three clusters that you found compared to the actual classes of these uh, samples that you ran through the machine learning algorithm. And you can see that, for example, one class is perfectly identified while the other two are kind of mixed. And so in this particular run, Cluster number one corresponds to Setosa, cluster number two, Versicolor, and cluster number three corresponds to Virginica. 
And so if you plot the output of the machine learning model, again, because each model will have its own sort of plot uh, diagrams and these are, are, are built in. And so it's rather simple to just plot it right away. And it shows you, in this case, a cluster plot of the data projected onto two components. So it does, uh, uh, for example, a decomposition of the data of all the rows and plots it or projects it onto two components. And you can see the data plotted um, onto these new components or new axes and uh, identified by the, the shapes that they have. All right, for example, to um, verify something like this, you can run a silhouette plot. Again, it gives you a sense of how uh, separated the classes are and the average silhouette width of each class. Now you can run the data again using maybe different combinations and run the machine learning model again and using the different combinations of features, compare the outputs and so on. As you can see, this type of notebook is what you might be using in the lab to you know, run different experiments and, and compare the results. This is principal component analysis. So uh, decomposing the, the data set into its principal components. Here, the first four principal components and take, are taken and a plot of, of how much uh, variance really is covered or explained by these four components. And then finally, a plot of the entire data set on these two components and colored uh, by their classes. And so it can give you a sense of where each cluster um, of, of, of points lies compared to the, um, the rest on these two axes. So this is really a quick run of a classification algorithm Really, what I want to show is that through a simple set of commands, when you have your libraries loaded up and all your code uh, in line, you can very easily have high turnover of data of, of data analysis of some kind of uh, you know exploratory analysis of data, and you can share this easily with your uh, with group members or research group members and discuss it. So I'll stop here, um, and I want to know if anyone has any questions so far before we move on really to our more distinguished guests. I hope I've given you a brief idea of what a notebook looks like, how, um, uh, for example, you could run through an analysis scenario in a notebook. Um, and our next speakers will, will, will get into really, um, will, will give you a higher level of where Jupiter lies and how extensible it is and, and all the types of different actual real world uses you may have. So do we have any questions? There is one in the chat, Ahmed, um, wanting to know if the notebook will be available to Yes, I will absolutely make it available. I, uh, I think it's, uh, I'll just check with ESIC folks what would be the best way. It's again, it's a JSON document. Um, so it should be relatively easy to share along with that simple CSV file, uh, which has the actual data. All right, if we have no other questions, um, I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Lindsay Higi and Dr. Uh, Fernando Perez, um, as introduced earlier by Shweta, and we're very excited to hear their talk. So Lindsay, Fernando, please take it away. Excellent. Thanks, Ahmed, and thanks for the, the nice introduction. That's a great uh, segue into our talk, you know, seeing seeing the notebook in action, uh, code being written together with, with a bit of a narrative, some exploratory analysis, viewing your data uh, and, and running some computations. Um, and so first I want to uh, say, um, you know, I'm, I'm pleased to be presenting both uh, here with, with Fernando, uh, my co-author on this presentation, um, and presenting on behalf really of the, the Jupiter Meets the Earth uh, team, which is, uh, uh, team of folks who are primarily at UC Berkeley and, and NCAR uh, conducting research um, in the geosciences and also working on uh, sort of co-developing ideas and, and making developments in the Jupiter ecosystem. So I'll go ahead and share my screen here. And so I'll give the presentation here, but Fernando, you feel free to, to jump in if there are thoughts uh, you would like to add along the way. Uh, can folks see that? We're good? Okay. Excellent, thank you. Um, so here I just put a link and this is also in the notes. If you would like to follow along with the slides or, or grab any of the links that we've posted in here, there's a bit.ly link uh, that will give you access to these slides. 
And so in this talk, I want to give just a bit of an overview of some of the Jupiter ecosystem, um, a project called Pangeo, which I'm sure some folks here may, may have heard of. And if not, that's fine. I'll give you a bit of an introduction. As Ahmed mentioned, it, um, it kind of combines tools like the notebook with also tools like Jupiter, uh, Jupiter Hub um, and really sort of targeted at, at geoscience research. And so I just want to also acknowledge that uh, the Jupiter Meets the Earth project is an Earth Cube funded project. Uh, and if you're curious to see um, sort of more about the description, the, the award numbers are here. There we go. Uh, and so we're really hoping that this will be a bit of a, a two-way conversation. I know I'll start out doing some of the talking, um, but really want to post some questions and use this as a chance to get some feedback from, from you folks on uh, sort of the use of Jupiter or, or not in your current workflow. Uh, so we post a few questions here. I, and I'll just read them out. And if you have thoughts that you would like to share, um, please feel free to add those to the document. And so some of the questions we have are, are what resources would be most valuable to you or your community to make effective use of the Jupyter and, and broader sort of open source Python ecosystem in your research? Uh, if you don't use these tools already, uh, what are you missing for, for your community? Uh, if you don't, or sorry, if you if you do use these uh, tools already, uh, what what do you think is missing for either yourself or or within your community? If you don't, but you're interested in using them, uh, what what can we do to help make that path easier? Uh, and if you don't, and you don't want to, uh, can you can you tell us some of those decision points and and perhaps why that might be? And so I want to maybe take a bit of a step back here and, and pose a bit of a question as to what drives progress in the geosciences. And, and perhaps this is a common theme in, in other areas of science as well. Um, and this is a slide that was originally created by Joe Hammond, who's a, a core contributor in the Pangeo group. And he really outlined sort of these three, three components. There's theory and ideas. And so these might be equations that we're working with, something about the physics that we perhaps know. Uh, this can also be, um, ideas that are perhaps statistical in nature as well. We have observations and data, uh, which we're now seeing much, much more of. So the example I've got here is uh, magnetic data, which is something I'm, I'm particularly interested in. And we have simulations and computation. So we can be running uh, simulations of equations, or we can be doing sort of the exploratory analysis of our data uh, to try and gain insights. And so it's really the interplay of these three components uh, that drive new questions and new ideas forward. Um, but what we're starting to really see is that uh, each of these are becoming much more complex um, on their own. And so this interplay is becoming much, much harder to, to facilitate. So data sets are, are on the order of petabytes, something like CMIP6 uh, is on the order of, of 15 to 30 petabytes of data. So that's, that's not something you can download and, and work with locally. Uh, in terms of simulations and, and computation, these are heading, uh, you know, we're talking about large scale parallel computations. Um, often run in the cloud. And so you actually perhaps need folks who have some understanding of, of how to deploy uh, computation on the cloud on scalable infrastructure. Uh, there's complex machine learning pipelines um, where now there's a lot of parameters being estimated, big optimization problems and such. And then the theory and ideas are, are getting more complex. We're stitching together multiple models, um, often in non-linear non ways. And, and these are perhaps also we're working with noisy data and, and all of these sorts of things. So as each of these becomes more and more challenging, um, we're really seeing that this, this interplay is, is much harder uh, to, to have happen and to, to facilitate. And so perhaps if we pose the question, how do we, how do we get the gears turning again? And so we've identified you know, a few, um, if you're interested to find out more, I'd encourage you to, to take a look and, and get in touch. It's a new organization. And so uh, learning a lot and, and hoping to develop something that, that can really serve the research and education communities. Uh, and so with that, I will say thank you. Here's the, the slides. Um, please feel free to jump in with questions. And Fernando, if you have uh, follow-up thoughts you'd like to, to add, please feel free to jump in. Thank you very oh, much. Oh, this was Lindsay. excellent. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you both very much. Uh, and this is fantastic. And we do have some questions. I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, read those out for you. And, and we'll definitely have some points to maybe discuss later, discuss later on um, in our open discussion session. So. Um, you know, I think this is a foundational question for someone who hasn't used Jupyter. What do you need to, to start using these tools? Uh, do you, for example, have examples of uh, what you've supplied to uh, particular communities and how that has seen uptake 
um, person, you know, says um, something analogous to a personal trainer, you know, how to use Jupiter to exercise. Fernando, would you like to take this one or you want me to? Okay. Um, this is a great question. And I think that, you know, um, some of these examples, especially with, with Pangeo of, you know, developing domain specific examples and the example you showed where, you know, you're showing machine learning examples, really sort of connecting, connecting examples to folks, uh, you know, the research, the research that folks are uh, engaged in, I think is an, is an important uh, component. And that's, yeah, that's definitely a, a common theme. Um, Fernando, I don't know if you have, or there's also, I guess, the Earth uh, Data Lab that I pointed to with, uh, that's being led by Leah Wasser. Uh, there's a great set of sort of resources there. Um, tools like software or um, places like software carpentry are also, are also um, good places. But yes, there's always a sort of a growing need, especially for domain specific examples that demonstrate the value to, to folks where their research is. Yeah, and I would point the audience to a link Fernando posted about uh, just trying Jupiter out. You can try it online with live demos, get a sense of what you could do with it. Um, and if I may add, um, <clears throat> I've been part of an organization, the Deep Carbon Observatory, and we've made a couple of webinars on uh, Jupiter and uh, spe specifically with geoscience data sets. And I have put the links at the end of our presentation. Um, but yeah, I would, I would encourage everyone to look out for workshops, um, you know, domain specific workshops that happen. We, we sometimes do things like that and others. Uh, so another question is, as a data provider from the other side, how can we gear up our data for access within a notebook without um, the user having to download the files? And you touched upon that a lot. Um, for example, being able to access the data set through a URL, a web service URL. Yeah, that's, and also um, I think projects, so Pangeo has done a really good job in a sense of, of data advocacy, in a sense of providing data on the cloud uh, in cloud-friendly formats. And so with that, then being able to actually um, spin up something like Jupyter Hub next to those data sets means you're able to start accessing, accessing those and, and really sort of taking advantage of scalable computation because some of these data sets are not, it's not possible to, to download those. Awesome, thank you. Um, do you know of Collab uh, Research Google, the, the Google Collab um, um, you know, initiative? Is that being used by this community or is it, um, is it in current use? Do you know? Um, I know it's, it's in current use. Um, in a sense, it's um, uh, a bit of a, a fork of Jupiter is that they've kind of gone in and implemented their own style of ideas on this, um, building on some of the, the ideas of the standards of, of interactive computing. Um, but there's a fair bit that's that's different between kind of the the um, core set of open tools in the Jupiter ecosystem, and and Colab. And I know uh, they're not the Colab. Yeah, go ahead. Colab was born. Colab was born as a as a basically as a copy of uh, the IPython code put inside of Google infrastructure, but. Today, it is a strictly proprietary tool that runs. I mean, it has roots in the in the open source uh, code of IPython dating back to I think uh, 2013, I believe 2014 roughly. Um, but it, it is not a tool that can be used uh, outside because it is by now probably has evolved internally to operate within the Google like services infrastructure. So it isn't a tool that we can adopt. And so as as a project. In Jupyter, we focus on kind of the open standards and open tools that are equally deployable on your laptop or on a, on, a, on a server. One of the ways in which, for example, in my day job, we see uptake is that at Berkeley, we teach using a web deployed version of Jupyter Hub, of Jupyter on, on, on what's called Jupyter Hub, which you mentioned already. Uh, and we teach courses that have thousands of students uh, taking introduction to computing and data science and data and, and, and statistics and data analysis. Those students obviously become, are going to become advocates and users later on. But for that, we require that, that all of these tools are fully open because we want the students to be equally able to install things on their laptop, as um, as they would be running uh, running uh, on uh, on our campus services. I mean, this is this is an example on my screen of uh, the lecture we were teaching a couple of days ago, and you can see the URL is stat159.datahub.berkeley.edu, um, and I have a tab next to it running basically the same stuff. 
in my uh, in my on my laptop, and we show the students how to do either. That really is an important part of the philosophy of the project that communities can take these tools and deploy them in whichever way makes the most sense to them. If it is in a in the infrastructure of a large cloud provider, that's great, and there are companies that build products on top of this. But we want the community to be equally able and free to use these tools in their own context with their own in their with their own data with their own hardware. Um, and, and so that's pretty central to the philosophy of the project. Thank you for that. And um, I, I'm, I think I know that there are uh, several spin-offs, if you will, uh, besides the Google one, but you know, Jupyter is the OG and um, it is, as you say, the open source um, um, approach to that. Um, so we have one more question uh, and then you know, any, uh, any other questions we'll talk about in discussion. Um, and this is this is something. This is a question I've had even after I saw the first Pangeo uh, presentation at AGU, the first time I'd heard of it. You know, the question is: Is Pangeo a platform for users to run code or a stack of software to install and run locally? So, <laughs> it's just maybe a question is: You know, what is Pangeo? And again, it, you guys just touched upon it, but it is um, a, a new concept, if you will. It's a great concept. So maybe just um, you know briefly reiterate. Sure. I I think what I mean. I don't know, I, I think uh, Anthony Arendt who works on the project, I saw Anthony earlier here today. So Anthony, feel free to jump in. I don't know if Scott is here today, but uh, from my perspective, what Pangeo has done was really something pretty special and unique in the world of scientific software infrastructure, which was they, they really recognized that the problem was kind of what is often called the last mile problem, right? That there were a lot of pieces already built that did the jobs needed for scientific, especially for meeting the upcoming challenges of, of analyzing very large scale data sets that are not really feasible to download where the put it on your laptop paradigm completely breaks down, um, where interdisciplinary collaboration uh, was gonna become increasingly important. And what the Pangeo team, and this is credit really to uh, Ryan Abernathy and Joe Hammond and Scott Henderson and others recognized was that the open source infrastructure to do a lot of that was kind of 99% there. And they, they made a choice, which I think was, was kind of bold. If you think of what the normal, and this conversation, this already came up this morning in discussions, what the normal incentives of academia are, which is that you always have to invent something new, something different, something quote novel, um, and then stamp your name on it, even if it's a half redoing of what was already there at the 80% level. So instead, and Lindsay already went to this point a, a little bit with her slide on the Pangeo pattern, which is very well discussed in their blog, they said, no, the tools are almost there. Let's actually put them together and instead finish the pieces that are missing for a specific community to really adopt them in, in earnest, right? And so what is missing? Well, the deployments are complicated, let's fix that. The configuration needs some tweaks that actually do take time. Let's do it and let's document it and let's make it available and let's put examples um, and let's actually engage with those domain users on, on their terms, right? Um, and so they were able to very rapidly have large impact, do things like put Pangeo hubs deployed next to very large scale data sets like the CMIP6 data releases, right? Um, in, in far less time than many of the cyber infrastructure projects that often get funded would have taken, because they embraced this notion that they weren't gonna own anything that would appear as new by traditional standards. In my opinion, what they've done is actually very novel and massively important, but they did it in a spirit of collaboration and building upon the work of others rather than trying to reinvent. And that to me is one of the most valuable pieces. Now, along the way, they have actually made major technical innovations. Uh, Lindsay already mentioned things like their work on cloud-friendly storage formats that has required a lot of low-level engineering because it turns out that the file system behavior of something like an S3 object bucket is very different from the, the low-level behavior of a parallel file system on a supercomputer that HDF5 was highly optimized for. So they had to work on thinking through what does it mean to have an object stored uh, an S3 style object store backing scientific data at scale. And that's where a lot of the work on XArray and the development of Czar has come, which is now impacting how HDF5 can be stored. But that philosophy of taking these existing tools, assembling them and building upon them is I think what gives them uh, so much value and impact to the community. And we are very much embracing that approach uh, with the rest of Jupiter. And, and I hope scientific agencies will see more of the value of that uh, rather than of reinventing half done things that carry your name on them, but nobody actually uses. Thank you, Fernando. Now, cloud optimized storage was, 
to me a, a big a big moment when I realized that it is a thing and it's being worked on how how much easier it would make uh, research progress. Um, well, well, let's talk about the other thing that um, really is important in research, which is publishing. And for that, I'd like um, to call on my colleague, uh, Brenda, is going to introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Ahmed. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Lynn Elkins. Um, she's a professor of Earth and Atmospheric Science at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Um, her research focuses on volcanic processes, mantle dynamics, and mantle crust interactions, and much more I'll let her explain. Um, but today she's discussing her research work and the use of Jupyter notebooks in that space, and will um, include her own innovations with Jupyter into a peer-reviewed publication. So let me go ahead and pass it to you, Lynn. Thanks so much. Um, let me share my screen. I'm gonna just give you a view of, of some slides here. All right, so can everyone see that all right? Yeah. Okay, very good. So um, yeah, thank you so much. Um, I, that last talk was fantastic and really informative. And um, in contrast, I'm not a data scientist and uh, really am more of, I think, a code user and stakeholder, though I've ended up doing a lot more programming than I ever thought I would getting involved in these projects. Um, most of my efforts have been through the Enki project, which um, is, if you're not familiar, um, an NSF funded project to combine um, geodynamics and thermodynamics approaches to solving geochemical problems um, with Mark Yorso and Peter Fox and Mark Spiegelman and others. I mean, I was kind of brought in as, as, as a, a user of code that wanted to be involved in this effort um, and a uh, not very experienced programmer, <laughs> if I'm honest, and um, have learned a lot through doing this and have found um, working with Jupyter Notebooks to be a particularly powerful way to implement code and apply it. So what I want to do, since um, my perspective on this is more of kind of a user stakeholder, is I think I can give you a good example of some of the things you can do with Jupyter Notebooks in a little more detail, and then maybe explain how we tried have tried to put together a publication and submitted it for uh, for publication in a journal as a manuscript through a Jupyter Notebook. We ran into some snags that maybe the Pangeo effort will actually help with in the long run. Some of what you're doing, I think, will help. Um, but working from just Jupyter Notebook, we uh, did our best and, and learned a lot. So I want to spend about five minutes giving you a crash course in geochemistry, just so you can see the types of problems that we were trying to solve. Um, I don't expect you will be an expert in this type of work from that, but at least it might make some sense why we're doing this the way that we are. So um, this was an effort with Mark Spiegelman as my co-author, um, and I'll show you the manuscript in the next part of the talk. So we submitted our paper as both a live Jupyter notebook where editors, reviewers, and hopefully if it's accepted, someday readers can run the code online. Um, that might be hosted on the AGU, publication server. It might be hosted at Enki, might be both. Um, we have to work that out with the editors a little bit, and it's still in the experimental stages. Um, we also generated a LaTeX created PDF version of the, the Jupyter Notebook, which allowed us to implement some details that Jupyter Notebook is not great at, like having consistent line numbers for editors and reviewers to use, things you normally see in manuscripts for publication. Um, so it was still a little experimental and we were working out the kinks. Um, so first, just about the project motivation and what the code does. Um, a driving question for my research is where does magma at volcanically active tectonic boundaries come from? And what does that tell us about how the planet works as a whole? So that's kind of my big overarching set of questions about the earth. Um, we know magma is the product of partial melting of rocks, mostly in the mantle as very cartoonishly illustrated here. As the process happens in the earth, um, we have to rely on essentially remote sensing tools to understand what's happening. And those, those understandings have implications for broader planetary dynamics like crust formation, plate tectonics, and whole planet evolution. 
so I think they're quite important. Um, and one whole remote sensing, if you will, technique is to look at the geochemistry of the lavas, but it's quite complex to decipher. And there are many outstanding questions for just a few of those questions. Here's a list. What's melting exactly? What is it? How much does that material vary in the mantle? And how important are those variations? Um, how is magma actually getting to the surface? Is it traveling through some kind of channels? Is it percolating? Is, um, and what difference does those, do those transport mechanisms actually make? Um, and it turns out the answers to these questions are quite sensitive to chemical factors we can test for, but are difficult to test for uniquely. So one approach is to evaluate the effects of variables in the mantle like these on um, the timing of melting and melt transport, magma transport through the mantle using short-lived isotopes. So that's what I'm focusing on for this talk and for this publication. Um, at least on geologic timescales, they're short-lived. So maybe not what you think of in terms of nuclear processes on human timescales. Um, I do this using uranium series isotopes, which are quite complex. So that's why I said this is a brief crash course, uh, but I'll very briefly introduce it today so you know at least what it is we're trying to calculate. And what we do is we can measure them in the lavas and then we compare the, the model predictions, forward model predictions generally, to the actual measurements that we've made. So this is one of the uranium series decay chains. It's an isotope decay chain where the, the long-lived isotopic parent with a very long half-life decays not to a stable daughter, but to another radioactive daughter that decays in turn. So it forms a chain where they all have different half-lives. This creates a very interesting mathematical system um, and also serves as the only tool we currently have for studying directly the timing of melting and partial melt extraction from the mantle. So um, although it's quite a complex system to work with, it's the only set of data we have for this type of information. Um, these, these systems, if left unperturbed, exist in a state of equilibrium where all the nuclides, all these different isotopes, will decay at the same instantaneous rate, even though they have different half-lives. You can think of it as like a series of draining buckets where one drains into another into another with different size holes, so they drip at different rates. But if you leave it for a very long time, they'll gradually all drip synchronously. Um, and so that's quite a cool system. And it means that chemical reactions that separate one element from another perturb the system by adding or removing nuclides in a substance. And this causes a disequilibrium, so they're, where they're no longer synchronized. And we can measure that. And it takes about hot five half-lives for it then to get back into synchronization or equilibrium. So we get timing information on chemical reactions is the, the basic gist of what I was just trying to explain. So for example, if magma forms by melting a rock, the elements like these have different affinities for the solid and the liquid that forms, and we can use them to track the timing of that. Um, this works best when we use isotopes with half-lives that are similar to the timescales of the processes we care about. So here's the uranium-238 decay chain. There are others, but there are three. Um, but this is the one we use the most. This initial parent is a four and a half billion year half-life, which is awfully long. That's the age of the earth. But thorium-230 has a half-life of 75,000 years. Its daughter, radium-226, has a half-life of 1,600 years. And there's another chain where uranium-235 decays through protactinium-231, and it has an intermediate one between these two. And those are the ones we focused on for our, for our model and that we also focus on a lot in our measurements. Um, to give you a sense of what we measure, so I'm going to be using these activities. An activity is just basically a measure of instantaneous decay rate. Um, and so it will always be in parentheses. If a system is in equilibrium, activities are all the same. So you'd expect if we compare two, two nuclides, their ratio would be one. Anything else would be out of equilibrium and therefore recently disturbed, at least compared to their half-life. So I'm just gonna throw up a whole bunch of global data. This is the kind of information we're trying to explain. So we've measured a lot of basalts around the world, not me personally, the geologic community. Here are lots of different isotope ratios, all activities in parentheses, and you can see they're not all one. 
we see various patterns and systematic distributions. There are mid-ocean ridge basalts on here. That's what the morb thing is. There are ocean island basalts. Um, and each side of the plot kind of separates one group or another for detail. But basically, we have a lot of variation to try to explain. Um, and these are from various tectonic settings that obviously exhibit some differences from one another, which is interesting and useful. So these are all from tectonically divergent boundaries. And these are all from hotspots that are volcanically active. Um, so there's no tectonic process here, which maybe tells us something different about what's happening in the mantle. So I can't get into all these systematics today, but basically we can tell they're not all in equilibrium just from measuring them. And that means there's something going on chemically that we can detect perturbing these decay chains in systematic ways. Our task is to decipher that information and figure out what processes generate these particular ratios and patterns. And that requires some fairly complex modeling because the process of melting and then transporting the solid and the liquid together through a decompressing mantle that's convecting and rising is pretty complicated. It requires modeling two phase flow of decaying nuclides. So we built a calculator in a Jupyter notebook using Python 3 that can do some types of modeling calculations that help interpret the data sets. The basic modeling options are everything travels together and is constantly in interaction and exchanging elements, or you have channels and you can suck out the liquid and it doesn't talk to the solid anymore. Those are basically the end member models. This one existed as a calculator that Mark Spiegelman developed after his paper with Tim Elliott in the early 90s. That code was hosted on the Lamont server as a Fortran code where with a web page front end, um, it could not be run in batches. You had to run each iteration manually and write down your results. Um, and now it's not available anymore because it's not secure. And so Lamont cracked down on server access. So it's a defunct, no longer accessible model, unfortunately. And it could only do this one thing. There has never been a numerical solution to this model that was publicly available. If you knew the right people, you might be able to get your hands on some really ugly looking MATLAB code but it was not really shared. So um, we wanted to improve on this and to make the code accessible again. Um, it, you were essentially tracking chemical exchange to varying degrees between a solid and a liquid that are moving at different rates while tracking radioactive decay. So we have conservation of mass equations that look something like this. And we developed from this in the, the paper, which I'll show you in a second. Um, so these are coming from the porous flow calculations of solids and liquids that are in equilibrium from Spiegelman and Elliott, beginning from conservation of mass. We have a flux with a porosity and a density and a speed, and that's related to a melting rate. And from there we can, and we can track a fluid and a solid with depth. You can do it with depth or you can do it with time. Here Z is depth. We can also do that by looking at concentrations of elements, I, instead of just tracking bulk. And so the second group of equations expands on these. And then Mark and I developed this version that adds a back reaction term between fluids and solids, depending on elemental affinities. Um, this is one of our new innovations that helps us use all of the, the spectrum between those two models I showed you. We then put it in terms of a dam Kohler number, and I know I'm speeding through the math super fast. Um, and we put it in terms of log concentrations so it's more stable to solve using a numerical solver. So we're going to solve all of this with ODE solvers. The dam Kohler number tracks the difference between the speed of upwelling and decompression and the speed of reaction. That's all a dam Kohler number really does. Um, so we put it in terms of log concentrations, we're gonna solve for you, and then we can back out concentrations from that. The rest of this is basically just radioactive decay rates and exchange rates between the solid and the liquid. So I'm gonna show you the actual code now. Hopefully this will be visible to you. Oops. I'm gonna to have to do this by doing that. All right, so. This is a Jupyter notebook. 
that we generated to be a manuscript where we develop all of the text and our derivations in Markdown. So we submitted it to an AGU journal. So we have key points. There's a standard abstract, um, an introduction, just like you'd have in any manuscript. And then all of this is done with Markdown. So if I go down to one of the cells that has a lot of the math derivations where we work through how we get to calculations of nuclides, um, here's the one with, with disequilibrium transport. You can see it's, it's all code in Markdown. Um, and so, in the hard copy, sorry, in the, the hard copy PDF version, these are actually properly numbered. We could not get that working well in Jupyter Notebook and ended up just manually adding uh, formula numbers. So that was one of the kind of clunky fixes we had to do that I hope in longer development in Jupyter Notebook, we can improve on. But for now, it just had to look right for reviewers. So we did a quick fix. Um, the LaTeX version we generated was a lot better <laughs> and had actual reference formula numbers and things like that. So some of the text editing and markdown conversion, we still need to improve on, I think. It worked okay for now. Um, and then if I scroll down, we actually have the code live in here. So if you go to the link that was shared um, in the information for today, you'll see that our preprint is there on ESSOAR for AGU. Um, that's the submitted version of our manuscript. And in it, in the um, supplemental information, there's a link to find a Docker image or to, to load this code. And you can actually run the notebook yourself. You may want to go to the kernel and clear the output to run it fresh so that it doesn't have any um, kind of hanging on data from the previous run. We explain how the code works here. And then um, we just show examples, basically. So we run through the code multiple times, running it different ways so that the reader can see what it does. We also have a more basic notebook version that just has the, the basic setup with options that they can turn on and off. But since this is a manuscript, we fully explain it. So you can load all the libraries. I'm not going to probably have time to run the whole code for you, but I can show you a little of what it does. You can load. Now we load all of our tables as data frames using pandas. That's one option, but it does make them look quite nice. It formats them well for the screen. Um, so this is the input file we just loaded. So what's going on behind the scenes is we have a Python file driver code that's, that's actually going to provide the plotting functions and the model functions that we need. And it also will um, get information fed to it by this notebook. That's one way of doing it that kind of cleaned up the notebook for us. We could have put everything in the notebook, but it would have been a lot of code. Um, and we can have plots that are drawn from this user calc Python file that we've saved in the same folder um, that can plot, say, the inputs. And we also will have some for the outputs. So I'm just going to run maybe one model version because I don't want to use up all the time today for discussion. Um, we can put in some basic calculation parameters the amount of pore space filled with fluid at the maximum, which is a reference value for the model, the upwelling rate, decompression rate, um, the uh, permeability exponent, which actually has a very small effect on the results, the densities, so we can track the fluxes. And then you can actually do this with having um, a system in equilibrium or out of equilibrium when you start. So you could change these numbers if you wanted. And then the model code runs really fast. That was it. Um, that's not always the case, but the equilibrium calculation is pretty, is pretty fast. The disequilibrium one, a little less so sometimes. So we get some model results. Um, and they, we set it up so that it has a caption and all the things you'd want in a manuscript. Um, we also below have other versions of the model. You can run the disequilibrium version, play with the damn Kohler number, compare results to each other in figures, and do batch operations of 20 runs at a time using different input parameters. So that's basically what we've set up for now. Um, then we have the usual manuscript trappings of reference lists and acknowledgments and things like that at the end. Um, but it might be more productive now if I stop and take questions. Thank you very much. This is amazing to see uh, because I, I, I have kind of worked uh, along with the Enki project, uh, very little work, but I'm aware of, of the amount of work that's, um, you know, behind the scenes and underneath to get this to work this swift and this fast. Um, so I have a couple of questions for you uh, from 
our audience. Okay, historically, geochemists, you know, have had a bit of a reputation for preferring spreadsheets versus using code. <laughs> Apologies for the stereotype, but um, do you see significant changes? And this is a great question, and I think it applies to all our use cases, not just you know uh, this particular um, you know geochemistry. Do you see significant changes? Uh, significant changes coming from students who come out of schools now being uh, more code proficient? Not necessarily, but willing to learn certainly. Um, I think it depends on who they take their classes from and study with, whether they're exposed to something else. It certainly is <laughs> probably an accurate characterization of geochemists that we like using fairly simple programs where we can see everything laid out. Um, and so spreadsheets have been appealing. For solving uranium series calculations, that has meant either doing very simplified analytical solutions, which, have, which are okay for some problems, but not okay for others, um, or the massive incremental calculation spreadsheet of Andrea Strachey from 2003, which is thousands of lines of spreadsheets to do an, a literal incremental line by line calculation for dynamic melting. It is very big and very slow and not very happy. Plus it introduces the uncertainties that come with an incremental model, which means sometimes I've broken it and gotten very unstable results. Um, so, it's uh, it is a, an issue. There are some things that it is still quicker to do a quick and dirty spreadsheet, right? But there are problems where it isn't enough. And having a, a set of reproducible code that others can use and modify and have public as open source, I think will be a significant step forward for geochemists. Melts has certainly been a big part of that, but U series that's been lacking the better code that has existed aside from user calc before it went down has been proprietary and people haven't always shared it. So you can't reproduce the results from their papers. So thank you for that. Um, another question is, or actually this is from someone at AGU, Shelly Stahl um, mentions, she says it's, it is a fantastic talk and, um, and she actually is AGU staff and would be interested in knowing which journal you submitted to um, and because it, as, as she says, there's really no good guidance on notebooks yet. And, um, you know, she would like to help out with getting ahead of questions that may come up. And so and she, she, her email is in the chat and um, I'll, I'll make sure at the end to save the chat. So, uh, but how, what do you think about that? That's awesome. Um, we went to Earth and Space Science. So it, because they have a data science application focus, that seemed like a really good home for this. And also because Peter Fox is there and he was willing to help us with format preferences. So we knew what the editors might be looking for. It was also a good choice. I think we were the second people to ever do this. So it's still in the experimental stages. Um, I, I know Kayla Yacovino submitted one right before we did. In fact, I was pestering her with questions about how she set up her submittable PDF and made it all work. Um, and so it's still very much a work in progress. If we can do that experimentation, get through review and, and see what's needed for publication if it's accepted, I think we can work out some of the kinks so that maybe in the long run, this can be more doable. Um, because I, I would like to clean it up, but we're still figuring it out for sure. Thank you. And a couple of other questions really on publishing in this manner. Um, <clears throat> do, you, do you think there would be need to adjust, uh, to make any adjustments to avoid uh, plagiarism? I mean, I'm not sure about that. When we publish uh, as a preprint, we can do it with Creative Commons licensing of whatever level we prefer. Um, it, the, the code, I, I think there is a question about just having code on shared repositories in general, which this is. Um, Enki, we've had long discussions at the Enki working group workshops about in the long run getting DOIs for versions of code and then the protocols and the best practices moving forward for modifying and expanding on each other's code. Um, I think we can learn a lot from computer science academics there and that it, it certainly, it doesn't particularly worry me because it is out there in its original form with my name on it, right? And also I am creating a tool because I want others to use it. So I think most scientists are honorable and will cite our 
code, just like they've been citing the publicly shared spreadsheets that are out there for some of the other models, like the original um, magma chamber simulator was a spreadsheet. I still use it sometimes, but of course we always cite the paper that it was originally published with. I think it does help to publish a paper to go with the first iteration of the code. Um, then you have not just a preprint or repository link, but you have a published DOI and full journal reference to, to go with it. So maybe that would help, but I think we're still figuring out the best practice for that, for sure. Thank you. And uh, the, the next, um, you know, well, we'll go through your questions and I, I think uh, we'd just like to invite our other speakers also to jump in um, and just open it up. Um, but uh, specifically to Lynn, um, and I think I'll put these two questions into one. It's it's about as a domain site scientist, how do you how advantageous do you see this method of publishing being? And and along with that, really, um, in the process of editing, um, how was how easy or not was it to use to suggest changes to your co-authors and work on on keeping track of the document versioning? And maybe that's something that <laughs> Lindsay and Fernando could maybe jump in and talk about. Is versioning? I having I'm an extensive user of Jupyter and um, I, I think versioning is one of the big areas where uh, we can make progress. So Lynn? Yeah, I, I feel like I'm still a bit of a dinosaur when it comes to versioning. I, uh, my only co-author was Mark Spiegelman and he's obviously much more comfortable with this, an experienced programmer and knows much more about software best practices as well. So um, he's very comfortable with Git it takes me extra time to remember every time the right steps to use it properly and version properly. Um, I'm still not super comfortable with it. That said, as a, as a scientist, academic, I've developed some of my own practices over the years where I essentially version everything anyway by saving them on um, native on my machine with dates and, and now, you know, with Microsoft now being friendlier to versioning that's even becoming more common in other manuscript writing. Um, but certainly it helped that we started in a Git repository so that we could use Git versioning and branches to track major changes versus minor updates. Um, that probably helped, but it, it still was a bit to clean up at the end to merge various branches and changes, things we tried that we didn't pursue. I, it's like working on any project, I think. Thank you. So I'd like to bring in uh, Lindsay and Fernando. First of all, get um, your reactions or what do you think about uh, this particular use or uh, of, of Jupyter in actual, in actual publication, public, public, um, publishable document. Um, and maybe tell us what do you think about versioning in terms of um, an, an update to Jupyter? For sure. Um, Lindsay, do you want to take it? Go for it, Fernando. Um, so Lynn, wa wonderful talk. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm uh, very excited uh, to, to see communities adopting these, these practices. This was very much our vision from day one of what we wanted to to accomplish, and perhaps I can I can share a few a few links that I'd opened um, as I listened to you speak. So for that first one is actually not a tool that we developed. It came from a third party in the community, but it's a, it's a it's a wonderful option. It's something called JupyText, which is basically a way of storing notebooks purely as text files, um, so that version control uh, with Git is a little bit easier, uh, and the diffs are a little bit more readable, and it still reconstructs the notebooks at the right time. Um, I personally haven't used it. Too much, but it is really uh, a wonderful, uh, a wonderful uh, tool. And there's a, there's a complex debate that we continue to wrestle with in the project between the choice we made of having a JSON format, which actually has its advantages because it's a single self-contained file that you could unpack 10 years from now. And it's gonna have the figures rendered in, the outputs and everything without the danger of that data being lost because it was in a companion file. Um, but having that JSON format does make certain forms of version control harder. And so there's a challenge, there's a tension. We continue to kind of explore what the, what the best solutions are. But at least I wanted to flag this as one of the one of the pieces of that puzzle. Um, and uh, um, Jupyter, and, and here there's actually a link to a tool called Mist Markdown that I wanted to mention. So 
Jupyter Book is a, a tool that Lindsay already mentioned in her presentation. And Jupyter Book is a way of basically wrapping around the Python documentation tooling called Sphinx to create websites and, and content made out of Jupyter Notebooks. But there is one piece of it that I had, the, the page that's open on my screen was pointing out to your issue with equation numbering, <laughs> because this is addressed um, in, uh, in Jupyter Book directly. And, uh, and MIST is a, effectively an extended syntax of Markdown that where we finally decided that we had to bite the bullet and sort of not continue waiting more years for the Markdown community to fix this, but actually come up with a carefully chosen blend of the best features of restructured text and Markdown that we hope eventually Jupyter will support that give us the ease of use of Markdown, but some of the extensibility and the syntactic extensibility that is needed for sophisticated academic publishing, like equation numbering and cross-referencing and tables with fit, cap captioned objects and things of that nature. So I, I invite you to take a look at this. The, the workflow with Jupyter Book uh, is, is actually lovely. Uh, we render, we are now rendering our, our classes with it. So this is an example of the course that I'm teaching right now. Um, and this, I mean, this is ongoing work, but you, you have tables of contents, you have nice navigable documents with potentially lots and lots of mathematics in them. But at the same time, it's all one big Git repository that can be rendered and that can be used live for execution. So connecting the notion of the document now to the execution, there's a project that uh, Lindsay mentioned, but I wanted to revisit, it's called Binder. It's a project within the Jupyter community. Um, and what Binder does is it lets you take a, a repository URL where you have at least explicitly identified what the dependencies of that repository are. And then it returns back to you a new URL, which is now the executable version of that repo. So if you have something that fits in a repo that has notebooks and you're explicit about its dependencies, that becomes a self-contained digital object that can be passed on to others Here's an example from the LIGO collaboration, the discoverers of the gravitational waves who got the 2017 Nobel Prize in physics. And their Open Science Center has actually links, not just to the repos, but to the binders. And so if you click on one of these links right here um, at the LIGO Open Science Center, you will be taken to a binder that after it spins up, um, it will actually land us into a live Jupyter notebook that has the code, the dependencies, and the data necessary to rerun the analyses, the statistical analysis and denoising of the gravitational wave signals that led to that Nobel Prize. It'll take a few seconds to, to kind of spin this up if the image isn't cached. Um, but this, this kind of takes us closer to this idea that a repository can be both an academic document and a live computational object that is, that is reproducible. Um, the EarthCube community actually this summer had uh, I don't have the link handy, but they did have a session where they did a curated review of notebooks for publication, basically within the context of EarthCube. And if there are folks from EarthCube here, um, they may want to be able to speak a little bit more to that. Um, this is an example that a colleague sent me this week uh, from actually my, my former community when I was, a, I'm, a, I'm a recovered particle physicist. But so this is a paper on that just came out on machine learning for physics and specifically for lattice field theory, uh, QCD. And you can see that this is a, an archive preprint, but you can tell that it's the rendering of a notebook, right? So they basically rendered the paper as a notebook, uh, the notebook as a, as a heavily mathematical paper with the visualizations and whatnot. So very much in line with what Lynn, you demonstrated, this is gaining adoption in the community and our efforts with tools like Binder and Jupyter Hub, and I'm sorry, Jupyter Book, are really including the effort with, with, with new syntax like MIST, um, is really to provide an end-to-end -to -end tool chain so that we can connect everything from an individual scientist exploring their data, like you were downloading and modeling your data, all the way to the end point of publishing and sharing and teaching something through a continuum sort of, of open tools that where each one builds on the previous one and that workflow is consistent so that we can iterate so that it's not just we've published and now throw the, throw the PDF away and once you have a bullet point in your CV, but rather to say, no, that publication is something that someone else can now grab and actually reuse and reuse it immediately, not spend two years of their life figuring out what you did. They can open that, they can start using it and they can build from it. And um, Shelly mentioned uh, that you were interested in, in more of this conversation. We'd be delighted to talk with, with AGU in, in, in the context of sort of Jupiter. This is very much uh, changing the culture of, of academic publishing in this direction is very much part of our vision. So thank you, Lynn, for, for that input.
Um, Lindsay, I don't know if I, if I missed something. Well, I, the one more thing that I wanted to show that is relevant to this community, but maybe maybe you have better links. I was opening the some of the tools that you've developed in the geosci.xyz community that combine precisely. So this is a project that Lindsay should speak to better than better than I. Um, that includes. Why don't you take it? <laughs> Oh, sure. Um, yes, so thanks, Fernando, for teeing that up. Um, so as a part of um, some of the geophysics work and sort of geophysical imaging, we ended up creating, we created a, a collection of sort of open textbooks. Um, so that first one there, the GPG, is, is meant for sort of introductory applied uh, and environmental geophysics. Uh, we we created some of this. I mean, it's it's very much in the in the spirit of Jupiter Book. We we started this project before Jupiter Book um, existed, so it kind of relies on on related but not identical tools. But there's again a lot in there, sort of connecting connecting ideas of of computation and um, and and content together, and and deploying that as a website that folks can just you know find find a URL and, and click on that. Um, one other one I, I wanted to flag, and Fernando, if you're sort of in the screen sharing uh, mode, is also um, NeuroLibre. That's um, one other example of, uh, I just dropped the link in the chat there, oh God. of a project that is aimed at um, publishing uh, yeah, with, with notebooks. Uh, so it's in neuroscience, but, but might be one that folks here uh, might be interested in. Thank you very much, Lindsay. I'm sorry, everyone. I was uh, looking at a, a different clock. We have one minute to go, and I think we'll probably be kicked off right away. So I'd just like to extend my thank on behalf of my thanks on behalf of my uh, co-organizers to our, our speakers. Uh, this was amazing, and I want to thank everyone in the audience for showing up. I will save this chat to a file because it is precious, and uh, I will find a way to share it somehow with everyone. So once again, thank you, everyone, for being here, and um, you know, enjoy the rest of your day and conference. Thanks, Thank you for the invitation to speak, and we look forward to engaging with the community. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Thank you Thanks all. Thank you.